Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to begin with our feature tonight, Eva Kaur, who died recently at the age of 85. She was a Holocaust survivor who had a unique story, and here's Matthew Bannister from BBC4, Last Word, to tell that story. Eva Kaur was the Holocaust survivor who famously forgave the Nazis for what they had done to her. She died during her annual trip of remembrance to Auschwitz. In 2015, Eva made headlines around the world when she appeared to embrace the notorious SS officer Oskar Groening during his trial for involvement in hundreds of thousands of deaths. But her friend and editor Peggy Tierney says things weren't quite what they seemed. She didn't intend to hug him. It was just something that happened. She bent over to tell him, I forgive you, and he just spontaneously pulled her into a hug, and she let it happen. I felt this was an old man who was very sorry for what he did, and he showed the ultimate expression of one human being caring for the other. And I cannot really just keep saying what he did in Auschwitz, because if none of us ever in life who make mistakes have an opportunity to improve our lives and become better people or repent for what we have done, then why get up in the morning and live? None of us are perfect. Eva's attitude was all the more surprising when you consider what had happened to her. She and her twin sister Miriam were just 10 years old when they were taken with their older sisters and their parents to the death camp at Auschwitz. When they arrived at the selection platform, the Nazi guards were walking up and down and looking for twins. And a guard asked if she and Miriam were twins They said yes. They immediately pulled her mother away from them with a hand around her waist, and she was reaching out to them and screaming and crying, and they never saw their mother again. And they put them into the care of Dr. Joseph Mengele, who committed very sadistic experiments on them. They would take a lot of blood from my left arm and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm, and those were the deadly ones. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever. Mengele came in next morning, he looked at my fever chart, and then he declared laughing sarcastically. Too bad, she's so young, but she has only two weeks to live. I made a silent pledge that I was going to prove Mengele wrong, I will survive, and I will be reunited with my sister. Eva was always the stronger twin, even though she was the younger one, and she always took care of Miriam. She said that's one of the reasons she thinks she survived, the people that had someone who needed help, someone to care for. It kept her going when maybe she wouldn't have otherwise. Eva and Miriam were liberated by Soviet troops, but both suffered health problems for the rest of their lives as a result of their cruel treatment. Eva eventually settled in the United States and didn't speak publicly about her ordeal until 1978, when a TV series called Holocaust inspired her to tell her story. For many years, she campaigned for Josef Mengele to be tracked down and brought to justice, but without success. Then, in 1995, on the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, she took part in an extraordinary ceremony of reconciliation. This is how it came about. She was contacted by someone who was organizing a conference on medical ethics. And he asked her if she could attend. She said yes. And she said, well, do you think you could uh, bring a Nazi doctor with you? And she said, well, I'm not sure how to find one of those. The last I looked, they weren't advertising in the yellow pages. (laughs) But then in another just quirk of circumstance, someone came to her and said, Dr. Munch, who was a Nazi doctor in Auschwitz, would be happy to speak to you if you would like to speak to him. And so she arranged to go visit him in Germany and was terrified, terrified to see a Nazi doctor. But once she met him, he was incredibly polite, incredibly kind, and she said off the cuff, did you have anything to do with the gas chambers? And he said, that is a nightmare I have lived with every day of my life and proceeded to tell her how it worked. So then she asked him if he would agree to come to the camp with her, Auschwitz, and sign a statement 
as to what had happened, and he said he would. He was very, very sorry for what he has done. He was willing to document what the Nazis did. And for that, I was very grateful, because the revisionists say that it never happened. And I believe that she also wanted to make a gesture to him at the same time as that, that extraordinary signing ceremony in, in Auschwitz. What did she give to him? She tells this funny story about going in a Hallmark shop looking for the right card and someone asking her to help her and she said oh no you don't have anything that could you know do what I need this to do but finally after about eight months it just came to her that she could write him a letter of forgiveness. I was a victim angry and miserable hated the whole world and I couldn't change it from the moment I forgive what Mengele did to me no longer destroys my life or has any power over me. I had some power over my life, present and future. Eva's son, Dr. Alex Kaur, accepts that her act of public forgiveness wasn't applauded by everyone, but he says it was good for his mother's state of mind. I think it was maybe selfish is the wrong word, but somewhat self-centered, but on the other hand, I think once she saw the positives of her forgiving uh, Dr. Munch originally, then Dr. Mengele, she thought, my goodness, I've got this great gift that I've given to myself. Why should I not let other people know? And she never told people to forgive. She offered it as an option for people hurting. So I think she had a lot of challenges, and I think that she was looking for answers. And once she decided to forgive, I think that gave her the answer and really set her on her path. Peggy, what did she look like? Oh, she was she was about four foot ten, and my son called her in this documentary that was made about her last year. He called her a four foot ten badass. She always, always wore a blue pantsuit. It was just her uniform. She had a deep belief in polyester being the material of choice for any piece of clothing. One of the most unexpected things about her was her sense of humor. And she used humor to kind of lighten the mood. Auschwitz is such a dark subject, and people tend to not know what to say. So she would make a little joke, and it would kind of break through that barrier. In 1984, before she went back for the 40th anniversary, my sister and I were very concerned about her going back. And so she came back from the 1984 trip and gave my sister and I a sweatshirt. On the front of the sweatshirt, it had a picture, the liberation picture. On the back of the sweatshirt, it said, my mother survived Auschwitz and all I got was this lousy sweatshirt. Extraordinary. <laughs> that's my mom. I mean, I mean, I can tell you a thousand stories like that. She saw it as a place of triumph. In fact, one time she got in trouble for dancing the horror because she said, I beat the Nazis. I survived. It was a place of great sadness because of losing her family and all the other people that were murdered. But at the same time, it was a personal triumph and just made her feel more alive. I want the world to know that every suffering victim is a potential perpetrator. They pass on their pain and anger and misery to their children and grandchildren. All the old ways have not worked so far. I call forgiveness a seed for peace, and I need everybody to help me sow those seeds for peace. Well, we're going to move on out to Justice John Paul Stevens, who died recently at the age of 99, local boy from Chicago, UC Lab School, University of Chicago, Northwestern Law School. Nominated to the court by Gerald Ford, he became the third longest serving justice in American history. Here's Judy Woodruff from PBS on John Paul Stevens. Retired Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, whose career on the high court spanned 35 years, died yesterday. In a statement, Chief Justice John Roberts said, he brought to our bench an inimitable blend of kindness, humility, wisdom, and independence. His unrelenting commitment to justice has left us a better nation. We look back now on Stevens' life and legacy. By the time John Paul Stevens received the nation's highest civilian honor in 2012, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he had already put his stamp on American law. The justice was a product of the Windy City, the son of a hotel businessman and an English teacher. A longtime Chicago Cubs fan, Stevens said as a boy he was at Wrigley Field in 1932 
witness to the New York Yankees' Babe Ruth and his legendary called shot home run. After serving in the U.S. Navy, working as a Supreme Court clerk, and lawyering in private practice, Stevens was appointed in 1970 to be a federal appeals judge. Then, in 1975, President Gerald Ford picked him to fill a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court, where Justice Stevens would serve for 35 years. In that time, the Republican appointee was eventually seen as a liberal leader on the court, although in 2011, a retired Justice Stevens told our late NewsHour colleague Gwen Eiffel that he never cared for the label. By the time he retired, you were considered to be the court's unlikely liberal. Were you really that unlikely? Or were you really that liberal? Well, uh, I never have uh, been a fan of trying to uh, use uh, labels like that to describe uh, uh, justices because very often the justice will be liberal on one issue and conservative on another. One of the justice's former Supreme Court clerks, Melissa Arba Sherry, echoed that sentiment. He was a true judge in that he just felt like the justice or, or judge, you know, is to bring their own judgment to, to each and every case. And I think that is what he applied throughout his his career, and it may have led to different decisions along along the way. Stevens' majority opinions handed legal victories to detainees at the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, who were seeking to challenge their detentions. Another ruled in favor of convicts with mental disabilities who had been sentenced to death. And during that 2011 NewsHour interview, he said he disagreed with the way some conservative justices interpret federal law and the Constitution. Everybody agrees that it's appropriate to do everything you can to understand the original intent behind both statutes and constitutional provision. But the notion that that can provide the answer in all cases is what is incorrect. It sheds light on all cases. But it's just one of the tools you have to use. Often, Stevens was in dissent. Even in his final months of life, Stevens lamented the court's 2000 Bush v. Gore ruling, which ended a Florida recount and effectively decided that year's presidential election. He disagreed sharply with how his conservative colleagues voted in the Heller case, loosening gun laws. And when I sat down with Stevens this spring for one of his final interviews, he said this about the 2010 Citizens United ruling on campaign finance laws. Why do you think it's had a, a corrosive effect on American politics? You just look at the amount of money. I can't give you the figures, but the millions and millions of dollars are, are spent on campaigns now. And often there's state representatives spending money provided by residents of other states. People in the district should be the ones who decide the outcome of elections. The ruling in Citizens United came toward the end of Stevens' tenure, throughout which he was able to maintain a rich personal life. Again, former clerk Melissa Arbus Sherry. He was very passionate about everything, about you know all of his interests, and so he had a lot of extracurricular interests outside of the court, tennis and, and golf and, and bridge and the like. Um, but he was so passionate about the law. I mean, for many years after he was off the court, he was still you know writing and speaking and traveling. I asked him to assess his lengthy career and his own impact on American law. You have a remarkable legacy on the court. You served for 35 years. What do you believe your legacy will be? Well, <laughs> it's difficult to figure out, but I, I'd like people to think I was an honest judge and a good judge. And I, I always try to reach the best result in every case. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. John Paul Stevens was a Cub fan. He confirmed that Babe Ruth did call a shot in 1932. So as a final tribute to Justice Stevens, we're going to play an old Cub song, the old Hey, Hey, Holy Mackerel, the fight song of the ill-fated 69 Cubs. Hey, hey, holy mackerel, don't doubt about it. The Cubs are on their way. Today. They're gonna pitch today, they're gonna field today, come what may 